something I want to take up, I guess, is um, really a question that Deborah laid out, I think, in her comments. Uh, we, some of us have, we have a lot of things in common, we think, but exactly what are they? Uh, and how common are some of these concerns? I'm going to lay out some that I've talked about and worked on and that I know other people have worked on, but I don't want to assume that all of us share everything I'm going to say, and I hope that part of what we'll do is figure out what we share and what we don't and, and how to work with what we do share and how to deal with our differences. <clears throat> so many of us here have spent considerable time trying to argue against what we see as the dangers of extreme parental selectivity <clears throat> or of markets and reproductive labor and genetic materials. Um, here I want to suggest three concerns for group discussion, a concern about selection, a concern about markets, even if those markets don't include selection, and a concern about the frequent dismissal of what are termed symbolic harms. Those three things, adoption, um, egg and sperm donors, and prenatal testing are discussed as very different and separate topics. Although there are many reasons to examine the history and current state of each of them individually, it's also important to highlight one crucial way in which they resemble one another. They all permit or encourage prospective parents to try to learn about and to determine some characteristics of the child they hope to raise. I'm putting all these cases, adoption, gamete selection, and prenatal testing together to suggest their commonality, a concern about parental selection. Perhaps we, as a society, should rethink how we organize all of these practices. In each instance, prospective parents are approaching parenthood by trying to ensure that the child they raise will possess some desired trait <clears throat> or lack an undesired one. Perhaps these parents want a child like them in looks or ethnicity, or one possessing a predisposition to intelligence or some talent. Perhaps parents fear the complications of raising a child from a racial or ethnic minority. Perhaps they don't wish themselves or their child to face the difficulties that disability can cause, medications, hospitalizations, equipment such as wheelchairs and lift-equipped vans, or arguments with school personnel or scout troops about including a child who's considered different or someone called a special needs child. By placing selection itself as the common denominator, an area of concern, I'm trying to avoid those arguments that primarily link the morality of choosing with the nature of the trait in question or with the method used to select the particular trait. There certainly are commentators who worry primarily about the dangers of sex selection or speculative futuristic scenarios of selecting the embryo or fetus who will have the musicality gene. We all want the musicality gene, right? These commentators perce perceive adverse social consequences of sex selection or seeking a genetically superior or perfect child. But when the trade in question shifts to one linked with serious, he serious health concerns or diminished quality of life, we find that many of the same commentators who would oppose sex selection don't find anything problematic about selecting against the future child who will have Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis. But to fairly address questions of prenatal selection, I think we need to understand how the same issues are raised when a couple asks an adoption agency for a girl and not a boy, or for a child from Eastern Europe but not Latin America, Asia, or of African American or biracial origin. Similarly, I think we need to ask whether ideals of the parent-child relationship are endangered when women and men specifically select gametes from people possessing traits they especially desire, whether or not those traits are ones they might reasonably have expected to get in their child had they used their own genetic material. So in sum, we need to ask what the larger familial and social implications are when people who actively choose parenthood also actively choose the kinds of children they do and do not wish to have. <clears throat> I'm not assuming we all share these concerns. I, I'm assuming that we think these, this is an important topic to discuss. People, some of you will share, will go as far as I have it, with this analysis. Some of you will stop way short. But I want to put that on the table. Next, <clears throat> I want to turn to markets in genes and gestation. Some people oppose commercial surrogacy but accept paying for eggs and sperm. Um, 
or some accept paying for sperm but not eggs. Often discussions of the wrongs of markets are linked to the wrongs of differential pricing, more money for the egg from the Ivy League athlete who also plays chess and the cello, less money for eggs from someone who graduated from a state university or, plays, or who plays only the cello but not chess or tennis. But I think it's possible to see dangers in markets even without differential pricing and even without the selection of particular characteristics. I think it's worth our struggling to articulate the dangers of paying people to help others to have children to raise, even if we paid the same prices regardless of what kinds of women provided the eggs or gestation or which men provided their sperm. But I'm hoping we can talk about that. <clears throat> If we got rid of selection, um, if we had not differential pricing, would markets be okay? Do we want markets in, uh, in expenses? I mean, lots of really smart people have really struggled about this question of markets, and I don't think we've gotten very far, so I'm hoping we'll get further. And last, the issue of articulating the harms or wrongs in question, if there are indeed harms or wrongs, lots of people, who, some of whom aren't here, don't think there are, we all know that to those who enthusiastically embrace current and future reproductive technologies, the concerns others here <coughs> and, I, uh, and that I'm raising are dismissed as merely speculative and symbolic. Often these concerns are linked to religion or are scoffed at as coming from people afraid of societal change. But I think many of us are struggling to find a way to show that one can be a political progressive, a secular humanist, don't let my university know that I think of myself as a secular humanist, <clears throat> a card-carrying member of the ACLU, I still have three months on the board, and we can still oppose at least some forms of parental selection and reproductive markets. To the extent that you share some of this analysis, I think we have a difficult task. How to find the shared values and language to reach our philosophical and scientific opponents, or if we think we have failed at that and we're never gonna succeed, how to find the values and language to reach the millions of people in this country and worldwide who haven't considered any of these questions at all. <clears throat> why do we, if we do, and why should the rest of society care about symbolic harms and why are they more than symbolic? Thank you. <clears throat>